right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Future Web Episode 4. I'm Brian Wong. I'm Joey Permiani. I'm Daniel Rusolovsky. Josh Buckley. And today we have a guest joining us, Josh Buckley from Mino Monsters. Future Web is a show where we discuss all things around young people, tech, startups, and beyond. And today we've got a really cool show. We've got a few segments. We're going to talk a bit about uh, new news uh, that's relevant to the Young Entrepreneur Group. We're going to talk about South by Southwest. Uh, those of you who are heading out there, we've got a few tips for you. Uh, how to survive, what to check out, all that fun stuff. Then we're going to do a segment called Planet of the Apps where we're going to check out some of the uh, cool apps that we all found very, very relevant over the last month. And we've got another segment called Internet 2015 where we'll have a chance to take a look at some of our favorite startups and where we think they will be five year, or three years from now. Then we're going to chat a bit about a little bit of a tips inside Silicon Valley. We want to take a bit of a business angle today to uh, the show on – uh, as from a young pr entrepreneur's perspective, as a young CEO, how do we uh, handle a few of the, the, the challenges that do affect uh, very regular uh, business uh, issues on a day-to-day -day basis? And uh, we're also going to talk about uh, must-use apps that startups now use today to increase productivity. So and we actually just got a new contact information for our show. So. Yes. Um, you know, you feel free to email us at uh, we're futurewebshow at gmail dot com if you have any questions or you have any um, responses for the show. We love taking in audio uh, audience feedback. Or you can also call us at three three zero three 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 ten twenty seven, and we'll be checking your uh, messages and everything like that for you know all the community involvement for uh, future web. So. And this is live on Twit Live, and there is a chat room. So feel free. To to talk with us we are interacting with the chat room we follow it throughout the entire show so if you guys have anything you want to respond or things like that we are watching it um so make sure to uh speak up and we'll definitely see it so with that i think we're going to get started with the the very first piece of news which is uh the ipad 3 so the uh apple is going to have their uh press event uh right here this week uh in san francisco uh, and so we wanted to talk about kind of uh, the iPad 3 and what we see are going to be the biggest use cases, especially for education and schools and things like that. Um, so, Brian, do you want to start off with your thoughts? Yeah, I think the angle here that I do want to take, you know, everybody has probably read all the rumor articles. There's a lot of stuff that we are excited about, of course. Maybe there's going to be a written display. Maybe there isn't. Who knows? Um, obviously, there's a, a lot of excitement. But I think one of the things that we should highlight about every major Apple announcement is just how much marketing they get for free even before anything actually happens. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and the speculation because it just affects, again, so many businesses. I mean, Josh, you guys have an iPhone app. Do you guys have an iPad app? Absolutely. I think, well, our app is built for iPhone, except it works superbly well on the iPad 2. And we see so much usage coming from the iPad right now. So. It's definitely going to be interesting to see what comes out of this release. What are you What are you excited about potentially for this new release? Like, are you are you kind of fearful of the fact that now you're going to have to design everything eight times as big because of the iPad Retina? I'm excited play? about that. I think it <laughs> opens up a whole new host of opportunities for us. Um, I think it's going to be great for stock price, which is I'm a stockholder. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's going to be. Um, I'm just excited about the whole release. It's on the seventh, right? The yeah. announcement. Yes, sorry. Yes, yeah. Yes, yep. On Wednesday, yeah, I'm just um, excited. I think the rest in the display is most interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, like, so our business deals with a lot of games and uh, and apps, and uh, we've seen how tablets, although they are sort of the the future, and everybody's excited about them, and business have, businesses have been built on just servicing tablet devices. One of them that's also founded by a fellow young entrepreneur is called OnSwipe. I mean, they're doing yep. just tablet based publishing. Uh, view uh, type tools uh, and I think the iPad 3 is just going to make that fever pitch even higher. I mean you saw that happening at Mobile World Congress last week or this past week uh, and everything that you're seeing in the Android ecosystem is evolving around that. So I think iPad 3 is just going to up the game and I think that's going to make everything more exciting on a developer standpoint. Do you guys, will, will you know, Monsters come out with an iPad app? Do you, do you feel like because of the iPad 3 you are more inclined to do so? So what we're going to do, our iPad strategy isn't um, so much launching the same title for um, iPad. Um, our current title works pretty well on iPad, but yeah. 
our basic idea is to use the same IP and launch a title that's very much built directly for the iPad. So it might not be so much like Minor Monsters, the monster battling game. They all use our same characters, our same IP, and it will take advantage of the benefits that is given to us to make a game that would be so much better just for a tablet. So Actually, use of that real estate. Why don't we take this opportunity to, to tell Introduce. people more about yeah, Josh? Yeah. Sorry, I kind of skipped over. Yeah. <laughs> so, Josh, why don't you give uh, the audience a bit of a, an intro on yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Josh Buckley. Um, I'm from England. I, as we can tell by the accent, yeah, apparently so. Um, I turned 20 like a week ago. So happy guess, birthday! Thank you, thank you. It's exciting. Um, You're no no longer a teenager now. I yeah, that kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> So I've been doing this approaching a decade. This by this I mean just um, internet kind of companies and business. Um, I started off by doing freelance work. Um, I used to I taught myself PHP at a young age, and I started building websites for other people. And then I built some tutorial websites which um, which taught people PHP programming. Um, and when I was about eleven or twelve, I sold one of these websites for two thousand dollars. And I realized like, hey, there's money to be made here. So. I started repeating the process, um, and I realized, hey, this is pretty easy. After a few months, it got kind of boring, so I I stopped doing that, and I decided on to build a bigger website, which turned out to be a kind of game. Um, it was a virtual world called Minutia. It's a really odd name. Um, but Minutia grew pretty fast, pretty quick, um, and it was in the middle of my GCSE um, exams in when I was 15 or so. Is that a British term? Yeah, so that's like when you're 15 or so. You it's have like to SATs? Go I guess so. I, I don't I mean, really know. Yeah. 15? Oh, never mind. It's not SAT. Yes, there, yeah, there are these yeah. exams which are pretty important when you're like 15 in high school. Yeah. So I was going through these and I was like super stressed out. I had these um, like 15 like volunteer employees helping me out. And the website was doing like between five and $10,000 a month in revenue. And my parents didn't know I was running anything. They thought I was just in my bedroom playing whatever game, Diablo 2 at the yeah. time. Um, and essentially it just got way too much. Like one stage I was literally like, I shouldn't be this stressed as a 15 year old kid. There's just too much going on. Um, and right when my exams were like at their peak, um, I had an offer to sell it to a company in Texas. Um, so it got sold um, back in 2007 um, for six figures. And I, my parents didn't know I was running it. So I went downstairs that night. Um, with, it was like 11 p.m. on an exam night. I had an exam in the morning. My parents were like, why, why are you up on an exam night? So I just handed my dad the contract um, with the website sale. and. Um, they were just speechless, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I just went upstairs because I didn't want to have to like talk all night to them about it. But um, I sat at the top of the stairs and like listened to them talk about the website sale. And um, they, yeah, it was it was awesome. So after that, I like sat on a bunch of money for six months or so. And I realized, um, what am I doing as a like 15 year old kid sitting on like a bunch of money? I should be like living it up and enjoying life. So I did two things. Um, I I started traveling a lot, so I went to like Miami, um, Thailand, lots of places over like weekends during school. So took, took a lot of time out, and I started angel investing. So I, um, I invested in about seven companies. I blew a lot of money, and that kind of brings me to now. So after after I blew a lot of money, well, let's talk about one of your in, uh, investments, which is Daily Booth. Yeah, so I um, I was the first angel in Daily Booth um, back in I can't remember what year, but probably oh nine ish. Um, so I gave them the money to build the website, and um, straight after they got into Y Combinator, um, I sold my stake very early on. So I take no credit for any success they have. <laughs> and um, yes, they got into Y Combinator, then they raised money from Sequoia, and that kind of um, oh, someone likes my shirt. Uh, that kind of um, brings me to the valley. So they got into Y Combinator, and they raised money, and they introduced me to Paul Graham from Y Combinator. Um, so they introduced me to Paul Graham, and um, we had a great chat, and I got into Y Combinator for the um, winter 2011 batch, um, which was fantastic. Straight after Y Combinator, um, we raised a um, million dollars from a bunch of cool VCs out here. And and then we announced we announced it really late, like last year. So it sounds like we've raised the money recently, but um, we raised it a long time ago. Um, and now we just, we've got a great team of um, between like 10 and 15 people. We scale it up and down, um, and we love what we're doing. We, um, I'm excited about what so we're I love that story. We're, we're so excited to have you on the show. And um, I love to know when you were 15, wh like, and you sold your first company, what did uh, the people that actually, when they bought the company, were they most excited about in the in the company? And was it the amount of users or like, what was the? They were excited about a few things. Um, one is it was producing revenue. So they're actually buying a business. They weren't, a lot of companies I bought around are just bought on like 
I know talent acquisitions out here. There are there are product acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's technology. Right. Um, but this was they were buying a business off me. Like they were buying something which um, was going to make money. Um, and it was actually like um, I don't know you could extrapolate the revenue and you could see like this acquisition price would make sense. And that was that was the primary motivation behind it. Um, like that's how we worked out the price. Like we just um, a, a multiple of revenue. Um, other than that, I think um, the product is not something that you could really just build out in like a month. Um, we kind of made it very defensible by um, by having a great art team, having a great design, mm -hmm. and um, basically building some technology that um, like made it very de defensible. But overall, is a business purchase. It's great, and for the money it was making. And and what do you think about companies like Zynga that you know are, are huge monopoly companies that really take a lot of information about you know the users and the data? Do you really, um, at the end of the day, you know, obviously you want to create a great business and you know have tons of user uh, benefit and and, and uh, people coming back to your site? But is it more for you about like the game aspect of it, or you know, like just creating you know beautiful games that people love using, or do you? You know, like what, what kind of motivates you to create a lot of great games? Um, so I don't think those two are things are like mutually exclusive. Okay. I think um, absolutely we want to create a great product and a great brand. Um, and like that's definitely like shows off in the culture of our company and what we build. At the same time, like I'm here to build a huge, huge business. Like we want, um, we want to be huge. We want to IPO. We just um, want to go the whole way. We'll turn down like small acquisition offers and we, um, at the end of the day, we're here to make a lot of money and we're here to build like something we're really proud of. Like our time is short, so let's um let's spend it doing something worth it. That's great. So where can people get the uh, actual app? Um search in the app store Mino Monsters, M I N O. M I N O. Okay, cool. Awesome. So let's uh let's go ahead and move on to our next segment, which is all about South by Southwest, which is happening uh starting next week. Uh it's from March 9th through the eighteenth. There are three different uh, uh, sections, I guess you could call them. There's the interactive, which happens first, which is why a lot of tech people go to South by Southwest. Then there's music, and then there's film. Um, but interactive, uh, basically people all over the world come to Austin, Texas for South by Southwest. Uh, Josh and I will not be there, but Joey and, and Brian will be there. It's so. my first time going, so I'm really yeah. excited. So my I went third. last year. <laughs> um, have you ever been, Josh? No, I really wanted to go this year, but I just couldn't make it out. Yeah, so it's um, people book tickets like a year in advance, like uh, flights and hotels, because it is so crowded. Thousands of people descend upon Austin, Texas yep. for this festival of all things tech, innovation, uh, music, film, and it's overall just a huge party, essentially. Yeah, it's definitely a, a great opportunity. There's work being done. Yeah, there's Come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when did you guys book your tickets? Uh, I heard you can't like get accommodation at all right now. Is yeah, the, the, the biggest thing is the hotels. So like the best thing is if you really still want to go, I believe you can still get tickets, but you have to um, get a hotel like that's about twenty or thirty minutes outside the city. And so the way like South by really started was you know people wanted from you know New York and San Francisco to kind of meet somewhere in between and yeah. talk about technology once a year. And and you know it's funny because you know a lot of people will see each other in South by, but they all live in San Francisco and they don't really see each other in San Francisco, but they'll see each other at South by just because you know every. Everybody's kind of there, and so this year I'm also excited. They're having a couple more programs. They're they're starting with their uh, fashion. They're going to have a whole new um, uh, thing about that at South by Southwest. And you know the reason why I'm going is we're going to be throwing a backplane hackathon, and so uh, I can give a little information on that. Um, if you actually uh, a big thing that we're going to be doing this year at at uh, South by is a big hackathon. So um, it's at Austin, Texas, at the Saint Cecilia Hotel, March 11th. From, from 2 p.m. And we're going to have people uh, uh, like um, Troy Carter, who's Lady Gaga's manager, and Scooter Brown, who's uh, Braun, who's uh, Justin Bieber's manager, and uh, Randy Zuckerberg, who's Mark Zuckerberg's sister, is going to be um, kind of doing our hosting and uh, commentary. So, And if you want to sign up for that, um, you know, go to the meet us there. Uh, you can go to backplane.com slash jobs and you can actually do the um, sign up for doing the South by Southwest ma managers Which hack. Which really shows you what the intention of that hackathon is, right? Yeah. It should be fun. <laughs> backplane.com slash jobs. The backplane.com. Uh, sorry, the, the backplane. backplane. Dude, amazing. No, you could at least that. change the URL to be like, hackathon. Like, <laughs> we don't actually want to hire you. We have a <laughs> Eventbrite thing. That's the fastest way because you actually, in order to get uh, to the hackathon, you have to um, 
fill out an application. Oh, got it. First. Okay. And, and Keep is doing some parties, right? Yeah. So we've got a few things happening. I'm paneling Friday in the convention center at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, it's called uh, Why Happiness is the New Currency. Uh, Dave Morin from Path and Ade Eleno from Formspring are both going to be there. Uh, we're going to be talking about a bit about how the emotional aspect of the web and, and mobile and, and being so close to, to us as, as, as our, our emotional reactions and interactions and communication have become more compact is something that has brought more happiness, I guess, and obviously the opposite, sadness. But we think that happiness is really powering a lot of the new services that are succeeding. I think even Josh, with with your company, you know, it's it's about uh, art, it's about interacting, it's about having this character. Apple and, likes to tell us it's about creating delight. So creating delight. When we went to Apple, like they gave us a checklist of um, ten things which you need to do to create something that Apple like feature you for and yeah. they'll love. And yeah. the number one thing Apple want is create an app that's delightful. Exactly. So I noticed that trend and reached out to Dave and Ade and they happily um, were, were willing to, to come on board and we're going to be talking a bit about that. So 5 p.m. at the convention center on Friday. And then the, uh, on Sunday, uh, we're going to have this, uh, we call it the DDP. It's a party called the Decentralized Dance Party. Uh, the site is bettertogetherddp.com. Basically, we're going to be taking over an entire city block, um, and there will be 40 boom boxes that are tuned to the same FM tuner um, that's going to have the same song um, or track and playlist. So it's going to be insane. And so that's going to be Sunday night. If you go to Better Together DDP, you'll see some of the details. We're going to announce the actual block right on the day of. So be tuned in, and we're going to do some some really fun stuff. So going to be a very very exciting uh weekend south by and, and is kind of the place that you know a few years ago twitter launched and then you know group me was the big one last four year square was four, two years ago four square was two three years, years ago, ago. yeah so it seemed like a lot of these social networks kind of got their foot in the door and yeah you know, yeah and south we by. joke around saying south by southwest is a big party i mean part of it is but there is a lot that happens there there's a ton of amazing panels um there are a ton of awesome parties you get to meet you know uh, when I went for the first time last year, I got to meet a bunch of friends that I met online who are from like New York and Boston and DC who I met, you know, in person for the first time at South by because it is kind of this meeting place for people all over the world. But speaking of parties, uh, there's a company called Will Call. Uh, where if you go to getwillcall.com slash South by Southwest, you can RSVP to all the South by Southwest parties, uh, which is a really cool tool. If you are going, you should definitely check it out. Um, uh, and you can uh, just one well, click. Service, that's very convenient. Yeah. So tips on how to survive. So for us that have gone before. Yes. Tell so, me what, <laughs> for the first time people that have never been to South by before, so, what to do. So, <laughs> Drink so, lots no, of no, water. No, no, no. So, so, so uh, Daniel will mention this. Most parties will require you to be 21 plus to get in. I was about to however, ask. however, there will be a lot that you can do that doesn't require you to be of legal drinking age. Um, lots of people go without tickets to the actual. Um, they don't, so you don't really need a badge. So I'm going to answer some common questions and and uh, and actually, if you guys have questions, ask me, and then I'll go ahead and answer. Yeah. Them. And, and if you have some questions on the on the chat, I'll go ahead and, and answer them directly. But basically, here here's here's what you need to do. Try going in with an open mind. It, there's a lot happening. You're never going to be able to do everything. There's a lot happening. Uh, best is to use GroupMe or some kind of a group chat application to loop in like 10 or 15 of your friends and figure out where everybody's going because everything's a lot more fun when you're going with 10 other people. Um, so what happens if you're under 21? Because well, how old were you when you first went? My first was was three years ago. So, so say say you don't have a fake ID or something, and you're under twenty one. How was your South by Southwest experience? It Daniel's was pretty not fun because he had to spend most of it in the convention center. But there are uh, parties that are in the streets that are after parties at There's hotels still and you lobbies. Can do without being 21. yeah, you you can go to open barbecues. There are a bunch of keggers that if you happen to know someone who works. At those part or at the companies that are hosting that party, you can get through the VIP line without needing to actually get your ID checked. There's a lot of things you can do to get in. The tips on the insider side for again being younger is access is number one. You can't usually get in just by lining up. You need to know someone in there. So Absolutely. the yeah. likelihood of you getting in is is much higher if you already know someone who works at that company. Uh, so try your best to And here's the thing: serendipity is the number one theme of South by. Most of the people that I met 
that are that, you know still my friends even to this day. It's funny because they say you go several thousand miles to uh, to interact with people or party with people that live a block away from you. It's very true because there are people that I've gotten very close to that live a block away from me in San Francisco. Um, but it's just because everybody's there with an open mind. There's no strings attached. You're all in Texas. There's this Texan thing what going on. In Texas. What happens in Texas? What happens in Texas? Stays in Texas. <laughs> Um, Unfortunately, it all ends up online anyway. Do you realize that during the day, a lot like most of the panels and, and conference activity happens during the day, but it's really the evenings that like. So my first South by, I remember I woke up at six p.m. and slept at six a.m. and my diet was uh, ice cream sandwiches and uh, a beverage that may or may not have been something that I should have been consuming. Um, and then you're from Canada. Though. Yeah, yeah, I'm Fine. legal in Canada. And then the second year was a little bit more intense because this was promoting my own startup at the time, which was Keep, because the first one I went as, as being a part of Dig. And there's no more Dignation this year, so that's going to be very kind of different. That's usually have been a staple. So it sounds um, like there's a lot of events going on at the same time, so probably just having the schedule and, like, picking which one maybe beforehand of, like, which one or, like, which speaker events you want to go to and things like that. Exactly. Good, yeah. But do the group chat text app for sure. Um, and for those of you who, who can't find a place to stay, do try Airbnb. And don't rem just remember you don't need a pass or a badge to get into everything. There's a lot of activity. If anything, it's just serendipity and running into people. Yeah. To uh, get into the convention center and go to the panels, you do need a badge. Yes. But pretty much everything else you don't. The exactly. other thing that I will mention is you're going to be walking around a ton. So make sure they actually wear comfortable clothes, especially um, – at night because you're just going from party to party and you're just walking a lot. How yeah. many people in the uh, chat room are going to South by Southwest? We definitely love to see you guys there if you're uh, if you're heading out to Austin next week. So and there are two um, two panels that we do recommend that you check out that are about young entrepreneurship and things like that. There's a uh, social media and young children uh, about kind of our kids' future and and how social media is going to affect that. So that's happening uh, Tuesday the 13th at the Omni in downtown in the Capitol Ballroom. So definitely check that out. Uh, some really cool speakers. Ian Small, the CEO of TalkBox, is going to speak. And then the other one is uh, about the Teal Fellowship, which is doing the 20 under 20 program, which is uh, talking about how uh, education and things like that and how that's all changing. That's on the 12th this uh, next Monday at the Austin Convention Center, which is pretty much where everything happens, uh, where all the panels and things like that. And that's from 1 uh, to 1.30 p.m. Um, so those are two panels that we definitely recommend you go check out. There's tons more. Just go to the South by Southwest website to get all of that um, all the information about panels because uh, it's just bound to be a good time. And maybe next month we'll get a report back from both of you about how your South by experience I'll do was. Some video and yeah, offsite recording. Yeah, I also just try not to get too overwhelmed. I, it, it, there's a lot of things. So there's a lot of like trending apps. Like people are talking about highlight in the chat room as being very hot. Um, the best experience is is actually soak it all up. Do download these things. Go follow the trends. Jump on bandwagons because that's the best way to to enjoy it. Um, trying to avoid internet it is there does not work. Your mobile phone will absolutely not work. There are so many devices there that half the time it just did not work ooh, for me. Ooh. Other tips, uh, ABC, always be charging. So <laughs> yep. do carry a carry a char the, the iPhone charger with you in your pocket because everywhere you'll run out of batteries very quickly uh, because your phone is constantly going on and off to, to check for network and you're texting everybody. Yep. Um, what other things? Um, a memorable moment from South by Southwest, I think it was two years ago, uh, Leo Laporte did uh, do the very first um, crowd, crowd surfing, crowd surfing <laughs> that <laughs> was live streamed. I saw that actually. You can find that on YouTube. I think that's gotten on like over right? a million. Yeah, that, that was yes, on Dignation. Yes. I think that's gotten over a million views on YouTube at this point. That was amazing. Yeah. That was. I remember watching it live. That was a very. That was a rock star Dignation show. That really yes, was. Yes. And that's just some of the stuff that happens at so South which by. Apps other than Twitter took off because of South by Southwest. Four, Four Square, yeah. Group yeah. Me. Four. Uh, last year they thought your bongo would. I'm not really sure how they're doing now. How did you say other than Twitter? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, um, oh, and there's the video right now. Yeah. Uh, oh, Leo. That was that was in 2010. Yeah, you can see he's uh, he has his live view pack on the back of him, um, and with that he goes into the crowd and uh, crowd surfs. Yeah, it's a, it's just a good time. Well, <laughs> all right. We'll see. <laughs> Hopefully he'll he'll crowd surf in a second. It's wow, awesome. it's right outside. The there he <laughs> is. Good thing he had a light. Uh, uh, uh. 
<laughs> there he goes. Um, so anyways, that was one of my favorite moments from South by. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, South by Southwest. Hopefully we'll hear back from both of you uh, next month uh, about how your experience was and your takeaways. Hossie from hard. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll try not to get too exhausted. Um, <laughs> hard, I feel I feel exhausted thinking about the next couple of weeks already. You have GDC week, next week. GDC well. is next week. So I'm those going. of you who are in the gaming community, GDC is the Game Developers Conference. You're going to have to sneak me into your party. <laughs> yes. Well, so I have a party also on Tuesday at the 111 Mina in San Francisco for everybody that's – everybody's welcome. Um, the URL is bit.ly slash keep GDC. Um, and then we'll uh, go to the next segment here. Sweet. So the next segment is a segment we call Planet, Planet of, of the, the Apps. apps. Um, Isn't that genius? Uh, so basically, we're going to sure talk about our, come up with it already. Our, <laughs> <laughs> our top five favorite apps um, that are either new or just came out with big updates. Yep. Um, our first app, Joe, you want to talk about Pinwheel? Yeah, so Pinwheel launched. Um, you can actually get it at Pinwheel.com. So this is Katarina Fake's new company, and she was the girl that started uh, Flickr. And uh, it's funny because everybody always talks about how there's these new applications. All the new applications are these photo sharing apps, right? And, you know, I haven't really seen a good example of a uh, group photo sharing application like pinwheel so what i mean by that is you know you go to a party and you're constantly and you're taking a lot of pictures with people in the same room this is what color was trying to solve right like a lot of people in the same room taking a lot of pictures instead of being profile centric people were being um it's better to be location centric right so i can share an album with you four take pictures and so i was actually having fun last week taking pictures with my friends and and you're sharing it in the same album and uh, you could see it coming in real time. So, you know, instead of the big problem right now is like you take a lot of pictures and you have to email or you Facebook it to your friends that also went to that same party. I'm constantly like doing, you know, photo shoots with my friends and they're like, can you send me the pictures afterwards? And this um, pinwheel app actually tries to solve that. So I think they are a great application to download. Um, you know, the UI is a little clunky. There there could definitely be a lot of uh, improvements made. But I, as overall, I would definitely give it like a four out of five uh, stars. So let's one. take an angle to this. So I, I wanted to discuss the overall theme of photo sharing in general as well in terms of just the impact that we're seeing this in the app ecosystem. I think there's just a ton of noise. I think... The dynamic of having a single, you know, album is cool and everything and, and people contributing. But I don't know if it's just me, but I find that everybody's thinking really small. So I which think, photo apps do you use? I don't use any of them. Don't I, mean, use I, I, mean, I, I mean, I use, I mean, I use two that I occasionally post to just because I know a lot of friends are on there. So there's Instagram and then Path. Right. Yeah. Right. Those are the two. Um but I, even those two already sound... But this is solving, I think, a different problem. Like, this yeah. is like if you're together in a small group of people and... So I haven't actually kind of used like, Pinwheel, but what do they do? Um, how do they execute better than what Color did? It, um, it's actually just simpler to add your friends okay, in okay. the beginning. So, so that's the thing. So if Color made it easier to add your friends in the beginning... Totally. <laughs> they're messed. Like, that's the thing. And this is a discussion part. I mean, this is opinion purely... Um, you know, my opinion is that... I think when you're when you're trying to solve such a, a tiny problem, there's no big picture, and that's just an app that's a function rather than a business. And uh, I find that photos, the funny part mm. about photos when you think about it is that with all the technology that we have built as a society, uh, the photo is still the best at encompassing uh, emotion, I feel, and obviously the, the short video. But we're all relying on that as the one major thing that we're using to interact with people right now. And it's blown up because of that emotional. And by the way, that's the thing that we're going to be talking about at our panel at South by. Um, <laughs> but I just feel like there's, there's really no big picture. And I don't, when will it end? Like, will there be a, 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 a sort of a, a, um, sort of a coming together? Will there be some kind of a, uh, consolidation? consolidation sorry. This, yeah. will, this, will, this is always like a big, um, topic that's been going on for a while about, you know, these companies that are more features rather than companies. Right. And, you know, I think Dropbox kind of proved that where, you know, it's people thought it was, you know, more of a feature than, than a company. But if you just do the, if the user experience is much better and it's just really simple to do it very quick. Well, I think these apps have proven they can like get huge traction. I mean, I've heard, I've heard some of Path's numbers and they're like out of this world. Um, I just wonder, like, when can they turn into businesses? Like, Facebook is the largest photo app on the planet, right? That's that's one of the reasons that's so huge. Um, and they can obviously monetize this, but 
I think once we see one of these photo apps turn into a business, and um, I don't know how it's going to oh. happen, don't ask me. Well, that's the dynamic, right? So it's the traction element, right? So and they've got the traction. Traction is yeah. both traffic and revenue, right? And when you look at, you know, Dropbox, they were monetizing from day one. They were charging on a freemium basis. They had a model where if you pass a certain amount of storage, you would have to pay. But they had to get the users. Yeah, they, but they couldn't do that without the users. Exactly. But at the same time, they had something that was generating revenue, right? But with me using Instagram, it's awesome. But I'm posting photos. How do how do they get money out of me? Yeah. I think yeah. that's the big problem with these apps. Oh, and, and Andrew's right, by the way, in the uh, chat room. It's uh, Pinwheel, the other... Uh, Katarina created the other pinwheel. <laughs> yeah, there's there's two pinwheels. Oh, this isn't Katarina fake. No, no this Katarina is. Oh, fakes. I was confused. Okay, this is another uh, pinwheel. Oh, Wait, yeah. the, the one we're sharing right now is not Katarina's. No, no. Katarina's good job, is without, Joey. Uh, is it's the one with the air balloons. Right? So yeah. this is not Katarina's. No, <laughs> the logos look pretty similar. I'll give you yeah. that. same name. All right, so by the way, please stop making startups with the same name as other startups. <laughs> yes, that's another one. Um, and a very similar logo, if I remember. Yeah. Uh, but in that case, let's move on to the next app, which is Karma, which is all about... Uh, yes. Brian, you want to take this yeah, one? Yes, so I'll take this one. So Karma was founded by Lee Linden. He's one of the original founders of Tapjoy. Uh, Karma is, I think, I'm, I'm a little biased because I, I like Lee a lot, but the, the, the app itself is, is genius. So gifting is one of the most difficult things to do in this day and age in that people are too lazy to figure out or not lazy, but it's kind of awkward to ask someone for their address, you know? And, and like, you know, you're going to have to wrap it and ship it. And, like, how do you get it to them? Like, like you know, just even choosing, you know, and, and putting in a card and just everything. It's, it's, it's a pain, right? So Karma's made that super easy. So I've been using it for a few months now, and I've spent a few hundred dollars on it already. Like, it's, it's that addictive. You can send a gift just by basically you're able to select someone – email, text message, anything, any contact information you have of them and select a gift and then and then a card message and then gift it. And they receive Give me some this, examples of of gifts of how did you use it? Okay, so usually <laughs> there's a lot of people that I like to keep happy that I like to send gifts to. Um just because I I'm I'm either far away from them or I want to, you know, maybe I don't get to talk to them that much, but once in a while sending someone a gift is a nice surprise, right? So what Karma is able to do is I can basically, it, it takes care of the, the hassle. That's, that's, that's the reason why I think it's such a cool yeah. app. Like, let me just show, so can I show? Some, so basically you're able to, yeah, there we go. So you're able to, to start a new gift right away and select from your address book instantly and use phone numbers and whatnot. But the catalog is the coolest part. So there's some quirky little cool gifts that you can basically gift instantly. Like a jam box is a little more expensive. I'm enjoying this close up of Brian's face. Yeah, then I'll just. Yeah. <laughs> so you got some teas. And let's say I wanted to gift this. Uh, here you go. Start. You can start the gift process. You select someone, but it, it, it's just it's, it's just very simple. It's very slick. Yeah, it's um, easy to use. It's just easy to use. It's just one of those things that was it was it, something that Hallmark should have done a long time ago. Card giving is awesome, but you also want to gift with it. And you want to make it just as easy. You think it makes it impersonal too? Imper no. So people that I've sent it to have found it extremely convenient because what happens is they know oh, they've it's gotten convenient a gift. for sure, yeah, but like they, impersonal. They, they've gotten the gift, but they, they, people said actually here's pictures of the gift actually being sent to someone. So. They, they wrap it, and it, it just looks very nice. Yes, it may be a sign of laziness, Josh. Um, busy people are lazy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, just, it's just really they, – people just – they like it. So far, people who have received it really like it, and it's just – I feel like businesses that make it easy for you to spend money without feeling like you're spending money. <laughs> just like Uber. Like Uber. Like, yep. It's just like Uber, but and for just gifts, like, really. um Exact is going to be. Exact, and then task grab it and all oh, these yeah. things. Like, you don't feel like you're spending anything, but you're And the it. receiver doesn't have to have the app to receive the gift. That's genius. Yes. Yeah, which exactly. I think is the biggest thing is because there's a bunch of apps where you have to have the app, like, on both ends of the communication in order yes. to actually I mean, have that's how the they're going to grow, right? I mean, yeah, yeah that's the viral yeah. coefficient. Yeah. But this is a cool yeah. part. It's, it's physical. Like, you can actually send people a customized tub of ice cream with their name on it. How awesome is that? That's ridiculous. Yep. Yeah, cool. Cool. All right. cool. The next app, which Thank I you. am super excited about, uh, is Clear, which has been out for, I think, two weeks now. And it's by a company called Real Mac Software, um, as well as 
uh, a company called Millen and Impending. I um, love it. Clear is the simplest um, task management software app in the world. So it sexy. is so many. I mean, it's taking things like gestures and um, are those the sound effects? Sound effects yeah, yeah, these are the sound effects from the app. Um, but I mean, it's just so simple. It's just gestures, and it's a really, really great app to use. I mean, it's. This looks like something I would. Design. Do you actually use it? it it's yes, I use it. Stop. It's so simple <laughs> and just like all the little details, like even the noises, totally yeah. makes it. So I actually wanted to take the devil's advocate on this, and I think people. Oh, I was about to. Oh, no, you, oh you were. Okay. Yeah. You I want, mean, you want. Okay. Well, let's, let's, go, go, okay, let's do it. Let's double team. Well, no, I, I, think, I think people double are just hate. like they're jumping on the bandwagon because it's just like. I got annoyed of the sounds after a while, actually. You can turn the sounds off. I need to turn up. But not not only the sounds, but it's like it's it's slightly gimmicky because it's a lot more functional. I think it's a lot of novelty. I mean, Apple love it. They featured the hell out of it. Um, But I think, um, I mean, you use it, so that's you've proven me wrong right there. But I think um, for me, I think it's it's obviously beautiful. It doesn't mean it's missing. It's missing missing rewards. You can't get rewards. Well, you need to add keep in the list. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, of course you do. Exactly. Um, (laughs) I think for for my tasks, I generally um, work my calendar. Yeah, beach no, ball. No, no beach ball. That was that. No, that was. Sauce, no, that was that was. You deserve a beach ball. Yeah. I, I kind of deserve it too, but. Uh, well, look at that double team. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But yeah, Shame so I think I think the what I like about Clear is how simple it is. I think that's the biggest thing. There's all these task management apps which try to do like sharing and like syncing with all these other platforms. And it's like, I just want a simple task manager where I can easily input tasks and say, yeah. I did it and it's done. But they're definitely pushing exactly the envelope of UX. I do admire that. Mm-hmm. I think um, when you look at buttonless, it, they challenge themselves. Like when I first met Phil when he was designing it, he was like, well, I want to figure out a way... <laughs> to do something just purposefully with no buttons. And so obviously you have some stuff there that just makes a lot of sense and, and just really cool stuff where you can like pinch and open up tasks and whatnot. But what's 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 better than that than just like a press, pushing a plus button? I mean like it's, it's the same thing. It's easier day. and faster. No, it isn't. Um, I don't use it every single day. Uh, I, I check it every day. Okay, um, yes. That works but I don't add new tasks every single day. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. For me, Is this one of the applications that actually like Apple – did do a feature on and they and yeah. they, it was app of the week yeah it yeah. was it was featured yeah. okay so whenever it goes on the app store there's this like little thing in silicon valley where like the, people from apple actually go to the company and like make sure that it's did, did they do that with you guys or we went I, to apple yeah okay you went to apple yeah what was your experience like with that in what sense just like the, and what, can you what even feedback, talk about it yeah like what feedback did they give you and, yeah so like i mentioned earlier um they gave us that list of 10 they invited um like 10 companies for a meeting. Um, I don't know what I'm meant to, or am I allowed to say, but it was like... Um, Probably not anything. We sat with them for like three hours and we just chatted and um, we have a great relationship with Apple. Yes. That's great. Which also raises another thing that I do want to mention. It seems like a lot, it, and, and I've heard this from companies that are making amazing mobile apps from outside of the Cupertino area and a 20 mile radius, is that, you know, being here is Definitely an advantage. Oh yeah, yeah, because you can just drive down. If I was in my bedroom in yeah. Kent, England, yeah, like it would not happen. They yeah, just yeah, happen. Of course exactly, so. yeah. exactly. So, anyways, this is people ask us. It's inevitable. You got to be there. But I do think, and oh, there's something we didn't discuss, which was Apple uh, acquiring Chomp. Oh yes, That's which huge. Uh, yeah. I I am I I, I am I'm overwhelmed by how amazing that <laughs> is. Wait, have we, did we add it or no? No, it's not there. Okay, well, I'm just gonna talk about that anyways because. I love that they did that, and it's the main huge reason for app developers. Yes, because right now the biggest problem app developers are facing is um, is distribution, yes. and it, it just shows that Apple are taking it seriously. Yes. I mean, right now the top twenty, well, the top fifty-three has yes. been proven that like the top ten spot or the top five, twenty-five spots, let's say, the vast majority have been like people botting their apps to the top. Well, and that's because discovery is broken in many ways. You know, yes. I love this. I love it because that means all the companies that are doing the pay a lot of money and get a lot of downloads that people don't care about your company and like just oh, yeah, to push up your, on your rankings names. will be gone. Amazing. Because that yeah. means that they were all built to solve that top list issue. And when that top list issue is not an issue anymore, you know, it's it, it's, it feels like the early days of the web before, you know, search engines and everything. You know, this is all... The same evolution we're seeing, and Apple is taking it very seriously. The biggest thing is discovery here, right? Yes, like, discovery is huge. I mean, I 
even worked on this at Google like four years ago about the uh, when they're doing the iGoogle apps and like a big thing was people don't want to search for applications to try to find out. That's why we have the show where we're showing off like cool new um, you know iPhone apps and and, and things like that. But um, what's a better way to discover like new applications? Because I still find like I get a lot of them through like my friends. I don't it's, really. It's find your friends. It's still very social per- process. But what Chop's done really well is they're just making it very convenient to. Uh, I guess, append data that allows more searchability and discoverability for applications and per, and, and, and functions. Like, if I'm, it, it, the, the app store search is broken. People know that. So it's like they're able to, to they, they were able to fix that. All right. The next application that we have uh, for Planet of the Apps is called Pop Booth. And I got it pulled up right here. See if I can get it actually in here. So Pop Booth is just a fun application that you can, um, so I'm taking... It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Uh, Three, two, one, and I'm going to take a picture of the camera. And it's basically a, a photo booth application that uh, does a really beautiful job at, um, you know, displaying. Uh, How much does it cost booth. for those uh, those printed ones? Oh, it prints them out. It prints yeah. them out. So um, what's great is you can email it or print them out to you. I think something that would be really cool to have in your home or office is hook this up to an iPad. And then you can create your own little photo booth at home. Yeah. And uh, so whenever your friends or family come over, you can, you know, have a lot of fun pictures to uh, to share. And I think it's great that you can actually print them out, too. It's super cheap. I think it's like $1.99 uh, to, to do the actual uh, photo booth app. So you can download that at popbooth.com. And then our fifth app is one of my favorite apps, and it's called Waze, which is basically it's a community-based traffic and navigation app. So you have this on your phone, and uh, through user-generated content, through the community, people report where there's accidents, where there's police officers, where there's traffic, and it alerts you based on that. So, you know, it's basically taking the GPS data and actually making it accurate. This is what the iPhone needed to have built in with turn-by-turn directions. That was the biggest thing with Android, you know, users saying that they have, you know, the speech turn-by-turn, and then, you know, for a while there was like TomTom, you know, GPS, but I think it's just really cool that you can, this is a completely free app. You can download it and uh, you get turn by turn directions in your car um, and the, and it works really great. And a lot of, we were actually going back uh, to San Francisco and we were using it and you could see like users actually reporting where the cops are and yep. you can, it's all user reported. Um, so I don't know how you report it while you're driving, but isn't that dangerous? Possibly. Yeah, I mean, well, that's why. <laughs> yeah. That's why I have my you know, co-pilot Joey have in the ca- car. Cause more accidents than have your navigator do it. Don't, yeah. Don't so Joey it. sits in my passenger seat when we drive. <laughs> but what if you're driving on your own? You're like, oh, there's a cop. Oh, shh. Daniel's my chauffeur. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 actually super easy. It's just two clicks to report something. Um, so but that's I mean, still looking away from the. Yeah. Uh, they need to figure out a way to better report. Maybe use Siri. Maybe Siri. To do it. Yeah. Yeah. I see a cop in one mile ahead of me or something, right? And then it'll automatically detect your location and post it for you. Yep. That's the coolest part. Cool. Next segment, Internet uh, 2015, where we're going to talk about our favorite. Yes. This is kind of a take on uh, a a segment that Conan used to do when he was at NBC, which was in the year 2000. Yeah, yeah, I already did that. Um, (laughs) But so basically some of our favorite companies, uh, we're going to basically – what are they going to be in 2015? Um, first one, uh, Pinterest. What do you think Pinterest is going to be like in 2015? Ooh. Joey. So in three years, um, you know, the the growth is, is doing, you know, amazing. I feel like they're going to be primarily more focused on, obviously, mobile and tablet, having a really great consumption, you know, mechanism for, you know, similar to how, you know, you flip pages in a magazine, like a digital Vogue, you're going through, like, you know, very, very quickly, a lot of content. It's going to be, we're going to see a lot more of this grid style kind of design. It's just a very good way to consume a, a lot of media very quickly. So um, I think they're going to do phenomenal. This will be around, and but they're going to primarily focus more on tablet. And I think beyond so that so these are where the different angles come from, which I love. I think they're going to add uh, a lot of e-commerce functionality into there because a they've lot of what been. they've yeah. been figuring it out. But they've they've become essentially a I view Pinterest as a like a crowd sourced storefront 
frankly. Like, most of the things that people will pin are exciting things that they like and want to buy or, 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 or have bought. Um, I agree. That's why their traffic is so valuable. Exactly. And that's why they are a viable business. Yeah, and stop worrying about copyright infringement because they're making you money. So, I mean, it doesn't, like, people are all pissed It seems like most copyright. of the stuff they, um, people pin on there is very aspirational. Yeah. yeah. Which I, I, it's Oprah's dream board. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's what people want, and I think that's very valuable. If you're sharing something that you like, there's probably a very high chance that you would yes. actually want to buy it, They're, too. So. Well, I wonder what their vision is, because I, I view that it may be like the new store is just, it has to be very transaction-oriented. That may take away the appeal of the, oh, I'm just, you know, collecting things and, like, putting it here and there, but... You know, I don't know if that's really the main appeal. So affiliate linking has tried. They tried to do that on Twitter. And now if they're doing it on Pinterest, I just wonder if people are going to feel like, oh, are they really sharing it on their Pinterest because are they getting paid for it? Or they're just, you know, like it has to be very transparent. That No, I think brands will do that. So there'll be like a brand or a celebrity or a tastemaker curated Pinterest page that people will trust. Like imagine a Cosmo having their own Pinterest account, which probably. I, they probably already do. They probably do. do. Yeah. yeah, they probably already do. And they should be able to get rev share off of showing products that they're recommending anyways. Right? Like a GQ should have a Pinterest page. Um, it, but it, wouldn't it be more valuable if I saw something from, say, Starbucks, instead of having a Starbucks actually branded one, that I see one of my friends drinking a Starbucks, and I would probably want to buy that from, you know, use that rather than knowing that it's actually like Starbucks. But I want, I think I want, they should separate the commercial and the and and the personal. I think what Facebook did really well is you know their branded pages, but mm -hmm. people still interact with them mm -hmm. because brands essentially become the self expression to. A certain degree and that's the reason why I think Facebook succeeded that way mm -hmm. what I'm trying to grapple with and I'm very excited about this is that they're they may be defining the new so when you look at the, the the explosion of social networking through different surfaces you have obviously Facebook defined it as a function but then you look at P tumblr and how that's kind of become their own little social network and then you look at Pinterest are they a social network yes absolutely yeah, definitely but are they a next generation social network yeah, I, I definitely think it's carving out multiple areas of just opportunity. Like, What just, makes them different than Facebook? Um, that they're more consumption-oriented. Bingo. That's how they're going to make more money yeah. than okay, Facebook. Okay, so in terms of time, because we're a All little right. running out, but um, the, the next one we'll just go over and then we'll do the next segment. But, um, you know, I'd love to, you know, like where is Path going to be in three years? So Path now has 2 million users. They're growing phenomenally. It's great. You know, it's one of my favorite apps. One of my favorite apps too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I use Path every day. Um, I was talking to my friend Dustin Dustin Curtis the other day, um, and we were like discussing Path, um, and where where they're gonna take it and how they're gonna have to grow. And like, I have a general idea of where they are right now. Like in terms of like, they have an insane amount of DAUs, and I think to really grow this, I'm not sure if their model right now of being the private social network is gonna work. In a sense, that it's going to work really well. It's for hard to monetize on private. I think they're going to. Um, lift I, the I wouldn't say it's so hard to monetize on private. I think it's hard for them to monetize in general. I think it's yeah. just that to really grow it, they're going to have to really like to take something like this viral. You need to allow like public posting. That's the only real way to like take something so huge. So. And I think they may have to lean like slightly more public in some ways. I'm not sure if they're going to do it, but that's that's the fastest way to grow. Okay, so I'm going to take the approach of not directly talking about Path, but the general fact that because they're the hot new network, that's the reason why they're growing so fast right now. So I think Facebook and Twitter and Path may be known in 10 years as my parents' social network. Uh, and that may actually happen. That because Path came out this year, the network that I built in that app this year is the most current one. And that's the reason why I'm checking it the most. But my loyalty to Path itself is not the reason why I'm using it. It's the fact that the people who are on it are the most relevant to me now. One of the most biggest differentiators is, you know, obviously they're primarily mobile, right? And their, their web version is only read-only, right? So, yeah. I mean, they really carved out the, you know, they were the first kind of to market of becoming a social network primarily on mobile that really took off, right? And so I bet they're, you know, obviously not going to have even a web version within three years, right? Like it just, maybe they'll, for discovery, but I feel like, you know, the the primary is obviously all mobile. They have the potential if they do this really well to becoming a proper mobile identity company. Yeah, mobile identity company. Yes, mobile identity by 
the, the the new trillion dollar industry that's about to emerge right now is 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 figuring out a way to use this and this and this so pictures music and my face and other things that I do in self-expression to become a part of my identity on the mobile front. That's interesting. I mean, Twitter won big with that because it was built into iOS as their, you know, like a, an actual profile. But Twitter is more communicative versus identity oriented. That's true. And I think identity then flows naturally into payments. I don't think Path will get there to no, tomorrow or next year or maybe two years from now. But again, when you like you said, if there's traction, there's a lot of flexibility. I don't know how Path is going to make money. But I know. <laughs> I know. Um, they are ridiculously huge, like way bigger than anyone expects. Like, yeah. yeah. Underreported how big they are. Yeah. And they, the way it's just a hockey stick graph. Yeah. I use it multiple times per day. Yeah. Like it, like the amount of like DAU they have is like that's a real company if they can. And by monetize. DAU, that's daily active users. Correct. For that startup lingo. Mm -hmm. Um. Cool. So path, I think you know it's 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 one of those things where you can't really predict it. Because it's changing so rapidly. Well, we're trying to in this segment. Exactly. Yeah. Um, right. But we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. I mean, at the end of the day, Path has a very loyal user base that I think will continue using it no matter what they do. Um, it's just a matter of innovating on what they're what they're working on. All right. Um, our next segment is called Tips Inside Silicon Valley, where we talk about kind of tips that we have. Um, this time we're going to talk about um, talent. Talent. Yeah, I think one of the favorite. biggest. Yeah, one of the biggest things that people are talking about in Silicon uh, Silicon Valley right now is how to find great engineers, designers. You know, uh, everywhere. This is a good yes. Yes. Yeah. Jobs um, at mindandmonsters.com. <laughs> Keep that me slash jobs. Backlane.com slash jobs. Yeah, exactly. Um, so wait, this week in tech slash jobs. No. I think so. Okay. Or twit dot uh, twit tv slash jobs. Okay. Oh, yeah, twit tv slash jobs. Cool. Anyways, um, so what are some of the tips that uh, the three of you guys have um, regarding hiring and how do you find great engineers, great designers, great people in general, great talent? I think we've sourced our engineering hires. Well, so we have like two kinds of hires that we make generally. We hire engineering and we hire creative. So our creatives are our artists and, um, and our animators. And that's a very different process to hiring engineers. And it seems like this talent discussion in Silicon Valley is mostly where do I get these top engineers? Like it's a very different process hiring creatives. So I just focus on that. And generally we've sourced our engineers um, from three places. Um, number one, it's been friend. The best source for engineers is um, I find is friends of your current engineers. Like they know yep. the best, they know them well, and Rebrowled. you can get them started really quickly. And some of our best guys have come from that. Um, number two and three are. Um, News.ycombinator.com has been great for us, and um, GitHub Jobs. Um, those two sources we've um, got a lot of leads from. But I think the best place to find engineers is um, from your current engineers. Yep. So in terms of business hires, I feel, again, referrals are also very strong. I guess one of the first tests that we use to figure out whether or not you'd be equipped as a BD person is if you don't apply through a regular channel. So if you figure out a way to email me or our head of BD or one of our investors to get an intro in or someone like that, you've passed the first test. So going through an application form, not going to work. As much as we tell you to do that, it's a test, right? Um, I just gave that away. So all you guys kind of should know. And I think this the now. other thing you guys should be doing is just um, if someone applies just and you're not sure about them, just give yeah. them some crazy BD task to do. Exactly. So like, we have tests that we this, do. Yeah. Like that you, you make sure that the person is able to, you know, not just talk the talk, but walk the talk. And that's a great thing about a BD interview. Yes. Like, it's actually on the job, right? You can just give them, hook me up a deal. Yeah. I think um, it's just fantastic. And like a good BD person will hook you up like any deal. Exactly. I think also the other part about talent is, is, is unfortunately right now, a lot of it comes from another company. Uh, <laughs> so most likely another test is if they're not working or have not been employed for more than a year, that's a very big red flag. Mm -hmm. uh, if they you get guys who... Um, and they've been hopping around a lot. I think that's a bad sign. Also hopping ways. around. That's a, yeah. it's a controversial topic though, right? Remember, that, remember Suster was writing about that article about loyalty and people who have done more than multiple jobs. I don't know if he was for or against it, but I think there are things to be said for people who are very loyal and things to be said for people who are skilled and disloyal. Um, and there's a, there's a, Sort of a, a counter. Like there's a there's a balance you have to. There's an equilibrium there, and and it's it's you can only find it out by meeting them in person. But that's just the first step. Yeah. 
Well, I think that the biggest thing is uh, what what Josh said is uh, the best talent comes from you know the, the people you have existing and, and the best guys friends. aren't looking. Yes, yeah. Everyone's the, looking for them. You need something better to offer them, and whether that's a product they want to be working on, like they want to, the best guys want to have a big piece of something that's going to be huge. Yeah, and that's exciting to them. Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. So we're running out of time, so we're going to do our final segment, which is uh, we looked at uh, our last episode uh, and what people were saying, and a lot of you guys asked kind of what tools do we use at our respective companies, um, whether it's apps and things like that. Uh, so we're going to quickly talk about some of our favorite apps. I'm going to start off and say that for communication, I think there's so many. There's there's Socialcast and Yammer and all these different apps, but the app that we use at Teens in Tech is called HipChat, um, which I recommend that you guys all try. It's group uh, communication, but instead of this one big stream, it's IM based. You got me so, on it. Yeah. So I, we started I've been, on Skype, and then we everyone moved to HipChat. Yeah. 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 So HipChat, it's basically you can do a big group chat room, and then there's individual uh i am conversations which i feel is the most productive instead of these long streams of you know conversations where people are responding in line and things like that i think the best conversations are over i am in terms of productivity and hip chat is perfect for that so i highly recommend um hip chat you guys use uh, a really cool app called fabricator which yep. was developed at facebook yeah so i actually met the founder of uh, fabricator and uh, Fabricator was built at Facebook and um, because it was just in, in terms of managing tickets and, you know, your features and ideas and bugs requests very quickly. Um, you downloaded it. Uh, it's Fabricator here. We got pulled up on the screen. Fabricator.org. Yes. P-H-A-B-R-I-C-A-T-E-R. And so it's what Facebook uses. It's what Dropbox uses. It's what Backplane uses. Um, so we love this uh, program because it's just a really simple tool, unlike Jira or like, you know, some of the other ones that people use for internal management of, you know, getting milestones and, you know, to-do lists and bug reports very quickly. Um, so they're great. The next one I'd love to talk about is Optimizely. So I actually met the founder too last week of Optimizely. Um, he actually had an amazing story. He was working at the uh, Obama campaign. And so he was doing all the A-B testing on the Obama's website. And so, you know, he really found that, you know, A-B testing is super important when you're building a product and doing a startup idea. We did this extensively at Google. Um, so all you have to do is uh, input the website that you want to run an experiment on. So this is an example of Dropbox.com, and you can literally just click and uh, hover over any element that you like to change. So you can move the position of uh, a, a link, or you can also change the text. And uh, you know, so here you could see that um, if you want to try two different variations. So say I want to say for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and mobile, I can uh, change it so I'm bolding one letter, and then you have different variation so we're actually running an experiment now and you can see um, two different versions and uh, so it, it's actually great for doing a very quick a B testing on landing pages so if you have a startup and you have a landing page uh, you can see which copy performs better which one gets you more signups and uh, it's really fun to run experiments on your designs because it always surprises you like you never actually know which one uh, will win until you know you you, uh, you test it out so that's a a uh, great application that I would recommend. What do you guys use at Keep, Brian? For A-B testing? Or for just any internal Well, tools? yeah, so we've uh, gotten to an interesting size now. We're at 25 people. So in terms of uh, reporting, um, one of the things that actually happens when you get to pass a certain number is, you, you know, people need to, you know, keep everybody up to date on what's happening um, company-wide. And so we use an app called uh, ThinkFuse. And ThinkFuse is really good on weekly reports. You're able to, so thinkfuse.com, you're able to basically, uh, yeah, love your status reports. You're, it's awesome because you can set different uh, circles. I call them circles myself, but they're basically channels where you can have different viewers, so to speak. And these viewers could be angel investors. They could be people on different teams in your company. So we have, you know, a this week in BD, a this week in sales, a this week in vision on my behalf and then we call it a keep circle for all our private investor communications and and basically everybody is then in the private channel and everything you push out there's like a much more manageable newsletter and you can also comment and attach to everything that's posted so it's a really great way to manage reports cool awesome um and then uh any other what about you josh what do you guys use internally um, at i think Vital the Monster? best like the best app to use um 
internally f- for us is Google Docs. Like we use Google <laughs> Docs for everything. We try to avoid like very specific apps, and I think um, we probably overuse Google Docs for tasks it's not meant to be used for. But um, <laughs> it works fantastically for all our purposes, and like, I'd rather stick with it until like we can't scale using it anymore. Yeah, Google Docs is awesome. Always, always. Awesome. So I think that concludes uh, episode number four. Let's go quickly around the table. Where can we find you online, Josh? At Josh Buckley, uh, minormonsters.com, joshbuckley.net. Thanks. <laughs> I'm uh, at Daniel Brew on Twitter, danielbrew.com or teensandtech.com. I'm Brian underscore Wong on Twitter and brianwong.me, and the company is kiip.me. That's keep.me. I'm Joey Permiani. You can follow me on Twitter at JP. Awesome. Mm. Cool. So that's episode number four of Future Web. Big thank you to Twit for letting us do the show and our yes, producer thank Liz, you. Liz uh, for thank making you. it all happen. And again, email us. Yep. Give us a call. We'd love to know your uh, feedback and suggestions. We're an early show, so we know we definitely love to um, hear everybody's opinion on the show of how we can improve it and make it better. That's what it's all about. If you go to future, uh, you can uh, email us is the best way, futurewebshow at gmail.com, or we have our new phone number, 330-333-1027, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you guys. We'll, co- we'll pick out the best comments next show. And yeah, say awesome. your name, and you'll be famous. Yeah. <laughs> Bam. Cool. So that's episode number four of Future Web. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. All right. Thanks, guys. Ugh.